Hello, dear gentle marketers. Welcome to episode 31 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. As always, I'm Sarah Sinek Roche. I'm the host here. And you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you are an entrepreneur who is tired of the traditional marketing model and are ready for a paradigm shift. You might also be a marketing impact pioneer, someone who's working in an organization, so not an entrepreneur, but in an organization who does business for good. Real quick before we begin, if you want to be informed about the extra episodes that I'm posting right now over the coming weeks in response to the pandemic, please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. I'm not sharing those episodes on social media or on my website. But today's a regular episode, um, as every Friday, that I recorded at the end of last year and it falls under the P of promotion of the Gentle Marketing Mandala. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can download your one-page marketing plan in the shape of a mandala that comes with seven days of email prompts to fill out your seven Ps. You can download that at sarasantacroce.com forward slash one, the number one page, sarasantacroce.com forward slash one page. Now, even though this episode was recorded quite a while ago, I think it really fits in today's circumstances, kind of similar to the last episode about paying from the heart with Mark Silver. Because besides talking about using referrals for our promotion, which is my guest's expertise, in the second half of the podcast, we also talk about John's new book, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, 366 Daily Meditations to Feed Your Soul and Grow Your Business. At the time of recording in December 2019, I didn't have my copy yet of this book, but of course by now it has arrived and it's sitting on my bedside table so I can always look up the daily meditation and prompt to reflect upon before going to sleep. In a moment, I'll read you today's reflection and prompts, but first, here's some more information about my guest today, John Jantz. So John is a marketing consultant, speaker, and author of Duct Tape Marketing, Duct Tape Selling, The Commitment Engine, SEO for Growth, and The Referral Engine, and the founder of the Duct Tape Marketing Consultant Network. His latest book, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, 366 Daily Meditations to Feed Your Soul and Grow Your Business is a daily reminder to entrepreneurs that the better you makes a better business. So let me read you today's reflection. Uh, So today's April 7th. And so I opened the book on April 7th because that's how it's organized. There's literally a daily meditation and reflection. So the title of today's reflection is In One Word. The cure for all the ills and wrongs, the cares, the sorrows and crimes of humanity all lie in that one word, love. It is the divine vitality that produces and restores life. To each and every one of us, it gives the power of working miracles, if we will. Lydia Maria Child, Letters from New York, 1843. So that's kind of the prompt. And then he reflects upon that text and it goes like this. How does one define the word love? Ah, and the greater challenge, is it even appropriate to use in the context of business? If indeed the cure for all or even some ills and wrongs is the goal of your journey, then perhaps expanding your relationship with the word love does make sense. Not in the romantic sense, but in the humanity sense. Do you know what makes you take risks? What creates connection? What inspires? These are all ideas that help entrepreneurial ventures soar, and they're all based on some sort of love. Love takes courage. Love takes wisdom. Love takes honesty. 
Love takes loyalty. Love takes dot dot dot. Maybe it does have a place in business. And then the challenge question. What attribute of love is missing from your mission? So that's today's uh, reflection, April 7th. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce you to John. So here's John and I, and this again is recorded in December 2019. Hi, John. How are you? I am great, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. It's such a pleasure. I've been following you for years and years, uh, duct tape marketing, referral engine. So, so many good books for someone who's just starting out. And as I just said offline, I feel like there's a return to basics or a return to the human connection and therefore a return to, you know, getting referrals, one of the best marketing techniques out there, right? Do yeah. I, the same it, thing? It's always been important to get people to to talk about you and share your business. But I think you're right. A lot of these digital tools that were kind of new things, new toys almost, if you will, you know, really had people kind of scattering into look at all these things we can do now and it's free and it's, you know, it's mass. And, um, and I think what happened is we as consumers, buyers have said, wait a minute, I don't want that. <laughs> and so uh, you're absolutely right. A, a return to a much more personal human uh, approach. Um, it never really went out of style, but I think people are realizing, yes, that is what we have to do because that's what buyers want. Yeah, exactly. It feels, and, and I just mentioned Mark Schaefer's book, Marketing Rebellion. He so beautifully says that the, the new generation, millennials, uh, for example, well, they don't want to be uh, marketed to. So they don't want to receive all these ads. They're finding all creative ways to block them out. Right. And so eventually uh, there has to be a return to the, the, the human connection or the, the referral marketing. And it's funny because you said in the, um, during, before we recorded, you said, well, it, it's harder. That, that stuff is harder than just paying for ads, right? So Yeah, and I, I, I'm not so sure it's harder necessarily. It takes more intention. It takes, yeah. uh, you know, it takes being more human, which, you know, yeah. the, the, a lot of this technology has taught us not to be. <laughs> That's so true. Um, in the book, you so beautifully explain why people actually make referrals. Could you explain that to our listeners? Well, my belief is that we're wired to do that. We want to do that. I mean, if you think back to when we were in, you know, cave days, you know, we had to make referrals in order to survive. I mean, you had to know where the water was. You had to know where the danger was. People had to, you know, talk about what, you know, what was good and bad about, you know, everything that was going on in life. And so I think that we're, we're sort of naturally wired to do that. And, and, you know, you, you, it's really easy to use kind of your own existence as a test for this. I mean, you know, how often have you or your listeners had a great experience and you just, you talk about it. You want to tell your friends about this, this company that exceeded your expectations or surprised you in, in some fashion. And unfortunately that's for good or bad. I mean, because if they let you down, you know, we talk about it today as well. And, and the, while a lot of marketers are realizing we have to treat our buyers as humans, we also have to blend that with the fact that, that they want to use some of this technology as well. So, mm -hmm. for example, reviews and, you know, how many, how many of us have gone on a website and, and, you know, total strangers have written good things about this business. So we go ahead and, and you know, buy from that business or stay at that, you know, hotel or eat at that restaurant. And I think that that's, that's the hard part for a lot of people. It's not just human versus machine. It is how do we blend these technologies in, in a way that, that, that meets the behavior that the, the buyer, the con customer, the consumer wants today. Yeah. It, we're not wanting to throw all the technology away. We want to be able to use it, but in a more human context. That, that's that's right. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we get good referrals? I think, I think, the art of getting a good referral is is still worth mentioning here, even though it seems like, yeah, you, like you said, that that's been around for a long time. But I still think today a lot of entrepreneurs are actually struggling with getting uh, referrals, and they don't make it also a priority for their business. So how how do we get these referrals on an ongoing basis? 
You bet. So, I mean, that I spend probably the first half of my book, The Referral Engine, talking about uh, not tactics for getting more referrals, but tactics for being more referable, because that's that's step right. number one. I mean, we're, yeah. no matter what yeah. we talk about, what tricks, what tactics we use, we're not going to get more referrals necessarily unless people are happy. Right. So I think the first step is recognizing that marketing doesn't end when somebody says, OK, I'm going to buy from you. Um, it, it, it ends in a lot of ways. Um, it, it never ends, actually, but it ends in a lot of ways when, when somebody gets a result. So we have to think in terms of, okay, that person said they want to buy. How do we now keep that experience amazing? You know, how do we make sure that we're communicating fully? How do we make sure that they are getting the result that we promised? You know, we have to actually think about all these stages of the customer journey uh, that people talk about as, as you know, I, I use seven stages uh, for our customer journey. And, you know, the middle part <laughs> is when somebody buys. So it's no like, trust, try, buy, repeat, and refer. And we have to think about our marketing tactics, our processes, our, our service, everything that we do as really getting to that ultimate point where somebody's so happy with what the result they got and the experience that they had uh, that they will willingly go tell their friends and neighbors. And so, you know, that's the first step. But then we also have to kind of nudge that a little. We have to we have to amplify our referability. A lot of times you'll read reviews and, you know, this company's got just glowing, glowing reviews. Everybody loves them, but they're not going back and saying, okay, you know, what would be a logical way to help people talk about us to to, to maybe take our referral champions and, and do something special, you know, for them so that they realize, hey, yeah, this is something that I want to do. This is something this company appreciates. And so you have to be referable. You have to think about processes and campaigns and, and, and tactics that are going to, you know, make sure that people have a great experience and realize that that's part of your marketing. Um, but then you have to go back there and, and, and do something to, to stay top of mind, to ask for referrals, to, to make it easy for people to refer you. Uh, that's, how, that's how companies that are doing a great job then actually turn that into a, a marketing machine. Mm. Yeah, I love this so much because it reminds me of uh, a lot of what we are doing on the Gentle Marketing Revolution program is this dance between being and doing. Yeah. Um, so you have to be uh, this entrepreneur that people are um, you know, the, we have similar worldviews, we share the same values, so there are attracted to you as the entrepreneur for being a certain way and of course there's the doing so meaning you have your skills but then from the entrepreneur's perspective there's also the what you're doing to get more referrals so again there's this always this dance between the being and the doing it's not just oh i'm just going to sit back and wait for all these referrals no i'm actually actively proactively doing something to get more as well yeah and and that's a part that I, I, I don't get pushback necessarily, but that's the part where people go, oh, I don't know. Don't, if I do good work, won't people just you know, talk about me? I don't want to go ask for referrals. And I think, the, I think where, where you have to get is a mindset that if what you do, your product, your service, what you do actually brings value to the people that you do it for, then you're actually kind of doing your customers a disservice by not helping them bring that value, that result to friends, neighbors, and colleagues. And I think that that's, that's the point of view or the posture that I think you have to take where, where you really, if you're very, very convinced in the value that you bring, you'll have no problem um, helping people bring that value to their friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Yeah, and, and I love how you, in the book, I think you mentioned that there's a right time also to ask for these referrals. So, so I think it can come over as just a very natural progression of your relationship and it doesn't feel like salesy or anything like that yeah. so if they're sending you an email thanking you for for the service you've provided yeah. that then that's a great time to follow up with that yeah those those moments of truth you know you yeah. have to be looking for but i tell you what where 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 i see a lot of people get results is when they also think in terms of referrals as um, an intention. So in other words, um, you know, a lot of times people will, will get a client, they'll deliver the result, they'll go back and go, hey, know anybody else who needs what we do? <laughs> but what if you started thinking in terms of, you know this client's gonna be so happy that you, they're going to wanna give you referrals, so let's plant the seed even in the sales process. Mm -hmm. You know, really early on, let's start talking about it. Here, here's what we promised today, 
And we know you're going to be so thrilled that at the end of 90 days, we're going to come back and we're going to make sure you're thrilled. <laughs> and then we're going to uh, allow you to introduce some other folks uh, to who need that result. Something of that nature, you know, whatever you're comfortable with um, in terms of, of delivering that message. But what I've found is that companies that do that get a lot more referrals because first off, it's kind of part of the deal. I mean, they've kind of agreed to it, right. but also you're, you're promising them that they are going to be so thrilled. They're going to want to refer you. It's such a powerful message. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good sales message, right? Because exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's like, we're, we're so convinced you're going to be thrilled yeah. <laughs> that, you know, we have no doubt that you're going to want to refer us. So uh, obviously there are, there are better ways to say that, you know, depending upon your, your business, your industry, your comfort level, but, but introducing that idea is uh, certainly a, a pretty potent way to, to amplify your referability. And I like the commitment that it takes also from the business owner then to actually live up to that promise that you just made, right? So Yeah, uh, yeah. we actually, so I, I mentioned that process of those stages. It's something we call the marketing hourglass. And so that's the know, like, trust, try, buy, repeat, and refer. And so we work with a lot of businesses that we use that framework to actually kind of say, okay, what would we have to do to get people to know us, you know, to like us, to trust us? And, and we kind of fill in the boxes. Right. But a lot of times what I'll do is say, okay, let's flip this thing around. Let's start with, you know, what would we have to do, you know, 60, 90 days after the sale so that 100% of our customers are giving us referrals. Right. Because we, we, we tend to start with how do we get the click? How do we get the phone call? You know, that kind of stuff. But what if we built it backwards? And, and so we were, we were initially focused almost exclusively on the experience that a customer had and then we eventually get back to, okay, how do we get them to pick up the phone and call us? Um, it does actually raise the bar. I mean, I've challenged people a lot of times and say, okay, what would it take in your business? What would you have to do differently in your business if the goal was to get 100% referral? So in other words, 100% of your customers will refer somebody to you. What would you have to change or do or add um, in, in order to get that to happen? And it, it, you know, a lot of times it really raises the bar to a point where somebody said, well, we'll have to improve our product, we'll have to improve our service, we'll have to give this, we'll have to do that, follow up, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they've, they've improved their business just by that thinking. Yeah. I, I love this story that you tell at the beginning of the book about the goddess note in your wife's coat. <laughs> uh, so, so your wife uh, got a new coat and then you were out and about and she puts her hand in her pocket and there was this note that just said, you're a goddess. Right? And, and so you had to look it up and it was, it was, it was basically the, was it the manufacturer that, that put that in or the. Yeah. yeah yes, it was. And it, and it was, you know, fitting with their brand. I mean, it was uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was definitely a very, uh, you know, earth friendly, you know, clothing yeah, company yeah. had probably had a spiritual kind of bent to, you exactly. know, some of their messaging. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was right on brand, but it was also just, you know, she pulled it out and she thought, well, that's fun. You know? And, and I think yeah. that that's those little things, somebody had an idea, you know, to do that maybe, or who knows? I mean, maybe somebody just started doing it. Um, but uh, those little things once they're put in place, you know, have such, can have such tremendous uh, impact. And, and so it's it really, you know, it's just a matter of thinking, you know, how, how could we up our game? How could we surprise people? You know, how could we exceed people's expectations? And you just start, you know, the, the accumulation of little things like that um, is really how you create a brand that people do want to talk about. Yeah, and, and what I love about this story is that it uses joy as a marketing currency. Um, it, it starts a story because, you know, I don't know how many podcasts you've been on where you told that story and it's in your book. And so obviously that's not going to happen maybe with every uh, story that you're using. Uh, but but it's the idea of using joy and making like this idea of feel good marketing is so important to me because a lot of times we use um, the other, the, the opposite, right? The, 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 let's talk about your pain and let's yeah. manipulate you into buying where this, it was such a positive story, such a beautiful, um, yeah, a story that used joy as a marketing currency. Do you, do you have any other clients of yours that have implemented something similar? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm sure I do the, the, uh, um, I mean, it probably nothing that parallels that exactly, but you know, I, we always try to do that with, uh, I'll give you an example. I have a remodeling contract we've worked with for years 
And after a project is done, you know, they do, they do walk through it, you know, at delivery and then they come back 90 days later and do another, make sure everything's uh, great. And at that visit, they, they, they have taken photos of the entire you know, time, you know, uh -huh. during demolition, during putting stuff in, they have it professionally shot, you know, after the fact that, you know, they use for their own marketing purposes, of course, but they then uh, get a book made, um, hardback uh, bound, you know, kind of coffee table ish right. um, book made of the project and they they give that as a gift and um, it's amazing uh, how much response they get to that idea because people I think I may have even written about this in the in the referral engine I can't remember but uh, um, you know people love having that kind of documentation maybe they've done some themselves but here's this kind of cool documentation of their you know big remodeling project but it also obviously acts as a, you know, a lot of times people come over, they want to see the new remodel, you know, at their friend's house. And, and now they have this kind of historical record, you know, that, that kind of showcases the remodeler and what they care about. So it, it acts as a, a nice kind of surprise gift, but it, it does actually uh, generate some referrals. I love that. Yeah. And, and there's, again, an emotional attachment, right? Because if you're remodeling, well, usually there's a lot of emotions and, and maybe a, a few fights with them. Okay. With the spouse, yeah, yeah, no, it's, like it's you know, you're going to come into somebody's house and wreck their routine and make them live yeah. in the basement for six weeks, you know, I mean, so yeah. there's no question there is a, an emotional component uh, to yeah. that process. So, uh, but, but, you know, ultimately, uh, in most cases, particularly with this company, because they, they do such great work, you know, in the end, they're, you know, they're thrilled with the result they got. And so yeah. you can help reinforce that. That's great. That's a great example. Well, now you've just actually published a new book called The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur. So I'm going to take the remaining time to talk about that. It's a collection of 366 daily lessons based on the text of the Transcendentalists. Yeah. You know that I'm in Europe, so I had, to be honest, I actually actually had to look it up. Yeah, so it's a, it's a you very studied Ameri them in history class yeah. over here. Yeah. In Europe. It, it's a very American, you know, concept because uh, uh, that's certainly a, a label that was applied to some American, you know, thinkers, scholars, writers um, in the mid 19th century, and uh, I, I suspect even in Europe, you know, there were some texts of of some of those writers that were. Uh, you know, the Scarlet Letter and, and some of Emerson's stuff. And I'm sure Thoreau, Walden, you know, is still yeah. Yeah. A, a classic that is read by high school and college students. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, d diving deep into uh, the, uh, the vein of literature uh, probably uh, will unearth for you uh, some new folks. Yeah. And so, so what they believed in is, is really that um, kind of like organized religion and political parties corrupt the purity of the individual and so th i guess is that where the self-reliant and kind of independent term came from yeah so so if you think about what was going on in america at the time uh, we were on the cusp of a civil war uh, mm -hmm. we, women were were still trying to uh, march in the streets to get the right to vote we were trying to abolish slavery. It was a very upheaval time in, it was probably the first kind of counterculture, you know, period in American history. Um, and, and so the writers at the time um, were, were really some of the first starting to, uh, and, and not just the writers. I mean, Emerson was a preacher. Um, you know, it was with the people, you know, were saying, Hey, you got to think for yourself. We're all endowed with, you know, a soul. <laughs> and, uh, um, and because of that, you know, we need to make choices that are right for us and not just follow, you know, the well-worn path that we're told to follow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of it was in response to, you know, this reform and, and this upheaval that was going on. Um, but as I dug in deeper into the literature, I found even the fiction writers in, in some of the, uh, the novels like The Scarlet Letter and, and Moby Dick, um, it was the first time that the, the protagonists and a lot of those characters, you know, kind of mirrored what was going on at that time. And so you had a lot of uh, protagonists that were very, you know, I've got to think for myself. It might cost me more <laughs> to follow my heart, but I'm going to do it. Um, and, and to me, I think that that's still today, 150 years later, some of the best entrepreneurial writing or advice for, for entrepreneurs. And so um, I, I dug into that and every day starts with some um, reading or text from one of those uh, works. And, 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 you know, as I said, people will be familiar with some of them. Um, I certainly unearthed a lot of, uh, you 
you know, letters and journals, uh, you know, that, that these folks wrote back and forth to each other as well, um, that will be very new to a lot of people. There were a lot of uh, women authors at the time who, even though they were quite prolific, you know, a lot of their writing didn't, uh, didn't really surface um, until maybe even, you know, Margaret Fuller's uh, uh, writing, uh, you know, probably the first, you know, true feminist, I suppose, voice in, uh, in America, uh, you know, her writing was kind of buried for, for many, many years and is kind of seeing a, a resurgence. And so um, I, I think a lot of people, you know, we were talking about this idea of being more human. You know, I think a lot of people are going back and saying, you know, the stuff that, that these folks wrote in, you know, the 1850s, 1860s, is so completely relevant, maybe perhaps almost more relevant, you know, than today. Than what's been written now, yeah. Yeah, than what's written now. And so I, I wanted to anchor the book in that. Um, and then I have owned my own business for 30 years. So I, I basically give, you know, some, some context or relevance uh, based on my experience uh, every day. And then I leave you with a challenge question. And I'm hearing from people that, that the challenge question is, you know, the part that really kind of anchors the day uh, for them. And so this is not a book that you pick up and go, oh, I'm just, I've, you know, got a long weekend or I'm going to go, you know, on vacation and, and read through this book. This book is, you know, almost like a daily practice is what it's meant to be that you, you read something and hopefully it touches you somehow has some impact, has you get, gets you thinking about, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, some, some change that you might want to make some way that you want to look at things differently uh, to, to, to really kind of help you keep evolving. You know, I, as entrepreneurs, you know, we go out, a lot of times we're making up stuff from, from nothing. You know, <laughs> we had an idea and we're, we're starting a business and we're starting to grow and learn and serve people. Uh, the world comes at you hundred miles an hour. And, and so, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's become very practical um, and reasonable, I think, for a lot of entrepreneurs to have kind of a morning, you know, ritual or routine where they will do some reading, some meditation, some journaling, and, and you know, which were all practices that, that Thoreau particularly <laughs> was a, a big fan of. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have kind of found that, that rhythm to, to help kind of center them for the day, get them thinking about the things that are important, thinking about the things that are right in front of them instead of past and, and uh, future. And, and that, you know, I think that kind of grounds and centers you. So, so at least for me, the idea was to write a book that, that, you know, maybe somebody jumped in for two minutes uh, every, every morning, you know, as maybe part of, a, of some uh, established routine. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And, and what comes to mind is, is also, again, this uh, balance between being and doing. Yes. And to me, it feels like your previous books have been more about the doing, like it's like, techniques and, and, yep. and frameworks and so it's it's beautiful to see you uh, how you have evolved uh, with you know over 30 years of business and, and 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 now you're also writing a book about the being and I think you're so right as entrepreneurs in a way I think I've heard this quote once where we're being paid for our own personal development to go through our own personal development right because yeah. uh, if you're in a corporate job you don't really have so much um a space or, 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 or time to reflect on who you are and what you really want and you know, what's your defi definition of success and all these really yes. important questions that as entrepreneurs, we, we tend to have more time to focus on them. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. But I will say that, that, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of organizations, corporations, whatever you want to call them, I think are, um, are reason are realizing and waking up to this idea that, you know, that, that a better, you know, a better individual, you know, makes a be better contributor, you know, to the organization. So I, I do see a lot of organizations that are uh, putting a whole lot of emphasis on this idea of personal development. But, so but, but you're so right, as entrepreneurs, you know, we're kind of in charge of that for ourselves. And um, I do think that, uh, I do think, you know, the, we all know, we probably all know how to do everything we need to do. <laughs> and, and so it really kind of, I wanted to write this book to be more about what we need to work on is the mindset to make sure that we're doing it instead of, you know, checking Facebook and, you know, doing all the stuff that can, that, that can take up all of our time. You know, are we focused on, on bringing our unique gift to the world to have the greatest impact uh, possible? And that's this book, instead of being a how-to book, uh, I like to call it a why-to book. 
A white tubok, I love that. Yeah. So I, um, as you know, I'm in Europe, and so I haven't actually received your book yet. It, we're recording this before Christmas, so I, I have my fingers crossed that it arrives before Christmas. But I've mm -hmm. listened to enough uh, other podcasts where uh, I know how it's structured, and, and and I heard you talk about it, and and so I thought it'd be beautiful if you picked a day of the theme. I, and you told me that it was September that talks about congruence because yeah. congruence is kind of a big topic for my podcast and my program where we talk a lot about um, having to, or feeling like we have to do marketing in a certain way that we see other people do it. And so we kind of start wearing this marketing mask for our own business and apply whatever everybody else is doing. And eventually, and that's exactly what happened to me, eventually waking up and saying, Oh my God, I'm, I'm not feeling whole again uh, anymore. Uh, you know, what am I really doing? Who am I? So I think this topic of congruence would be uh, really great if we, if you picked maybe one day in September that you could read aloud and comment on it. Yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, it's so easy to get knocked out of congruence because again, we're 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 wading into things we don't know, we've never done before. We're trying to figure it out, and so a lot of times. We do exactly that. We go and see what everybody else is doing. Oh, they're running Facebook ads that talk about this and have, uh, you know, have an expiration time and you get a special deal. And, and it, you know, ultimately when we step back and look at it, we go, that's kind of icky. You know, that's not really me. That's not the message I want to put out there um, in the world. I'm not proud of, you know, that work. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I'm not casting, you know, blame. I mean, it just, it, it's so easy to do because of the nature of what it is that we do. And so, you know, having, uh, having your core values, you know, almost using them as, as a way to say, okay, does this, you know, does this check the boxes? You know, okay, yes, we can do it. Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes it's just gut feeling, but a lot of times because of the swirl of, you know, everyday entrepreneurship and, you know, the rat race of, you know, trying to figure it out. A lot of times we, we have to take time to remind ourselves that, you know, is this on brand? You know, is this, is this me? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So Today's uh, reading, I picked, you told me to pick one or asked me to pick one from uh, September uh, because the theme of that month is congruence. Um, so every day starts with a title, uh, then a reading from some literature that I chose and then 100, 200 words from me, uh, and then a question. Mm -hmm. So I picked September 14th. Um, the title is Entirely Happy. I was something that lay under the sun and felt it like the pumpkins, and I did not want to be anything more. I was entirely happy. Perhaps we feel like that when we die and become a part of something entire, whether it is sun and air or goodness and knowledge. At any rate, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. When it comes to one, it comes as naturally as sleep. That's from uh, American author Willa Cather's book, My Antonia, which was written in 1918. Happiness, that's what we all want, isn't it? But to have a goal, any goal, to achieve a goal, much less such an ambitious one like achieving happiness, you must first possess the ability to describe what a win looks like. Or is the search for happiness such an elusive one because we have no final destination in mind? We remain hopelessly lost in our journey, but at least we're making good time. Let's borrow Cather's description as a great starting point. At any rate, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. There's nothing scientific or even terribly philosophical about Cather's description. It is at once melodic, perpetual, and filled with life. It's fitting that this is the quote inscribed on Cather's gravestone as well. So could you live with that? Would that be enough to be dissolved into something complete and great? So your challenge question, what do you think happiness feels like? Can you describe it? Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks. Uh, happiness, um, I think what it brings up is so many other things when it comes to business, right? Because um, what I just wrote about is um, the definition of success and how we, if we're not clear with how we define success, which I guess could be replaced by happiness, yeah. then we're kind of being fed this mainstream of you know, how everybody else defines happiness or success. And so if we're not clear with what it means for us, we keep 
we could live our whole life striving for someone else's definition of happiness, I guess. And many do, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I've, I've actually of late been kind of, you know, I, I, this book in a lot of ways was a, a journey for me, of course. Um, and I continue the, the journey, you know, I'm, I'm starting a community of, of folks who want to discuss uh, these themes uh, starting in the beginning of uh, 2020. Um, and so I've been continuing to write about these ideas. And, and one of the, one of the ideas that um, I'm wrestling with still is, is, is there a difference between joy and happiness? You know, does our happiness chasing happiness actually rob us of our joy? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think that that's, I think that's something that a lot of people, because of the way we've defined happiness or what will bring us happiness, you know, we sometimes kind of uh, uh, sacrifice uh, being joyful in the moment. Um, whatever we're doing or wherever we're going. And uh, I think that's a concept uh, that that's, I'm still wrestling with. Yeah, I'd be really interested on, to hear what comes out of that because it's, it's so true. It's these two terms that we just kind of throw around as being the same, but maybe they, yep. they are not the same. Personally, I can't uh, wait for, for my book to, to arrive and really make sure that this is part of my daily routine. I, I have a gratitude routine that I usually do at night and then a meditation routine that I do in the morning. And I can see myself, yeah, definitely going through one page of the book the minute I you know, get to my office and say, okay, let, let me look at John's text. So looking yeah, forward yeah. to that. Well, I, I, I hope that that's how people um, find it to, to be useful. You know, one of the things I've found is that the you know, even if I ask that question and I don't immediately, although the book is set up so that you've got a couple of lines, if you're one of those people that wants to highlight and jot notes, you can in the book. But um, I find that that the question kind of stays with you. And then the, there'll be points throughout the day where something will happen and I'll go, oh, that's kind of how I react to that. Or that's kind of how I do that. And, and I think that, I think growth, any growth that we're going to have, you know, requires kind of that first witnessing, you know, how it shows up or how some good or bad uh, habit or thing that we call good or bad uh, shows up because uh, a lot of times we do things just habitually and, and don't even think about them. So uh, having some, um, some space to maybe kind of think about and, and maybe even set intentions, you know, for what you want to do for the day, I think is a great practice. Yeah. And I agree with you. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a lot of writing if that's not your thing. I, I think, I think the subconscious mind sometimes brings you the answers just because you, you read that text and then, and, yeah. and then it's somewhere sitting there in the back of your brain. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I think that's where our, our, our brains work. Yeah. This has been so beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to sit with me and discuss these questions, John. I'm super grateful for our time together. My pleasure. And uh, um, I'll, I'll send you a, a digital copy if you want to get started so that uh, um, you you don't have to wait for the hard copy. Although this is a book that I think really is is better. Oh, in, I think it'll be so in, much better. <laughs> in in <laughs> hard copy. Um, <laughs> although they're, they're uh, dependent upon when people are listening to this uh, sometime in January, the audio book will come out as well. So oh. if you liked my reading today, you, you can hear 366 of them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah, that's a good one too, to have just a, a small audio every day. So Yeah, I, I listen to some um, guided meditations myself um, in, the, in the mornings. And, uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of people that are kind of in that habit of, of listening to a little something and then reflecting on it. Yeah. So yeah, we want to just make sure that we say the title again, The Self-Reliant okay. Entrepreneur, and you can uh, find that on Amazon. I'm sure by the time this airs, it'll also be available in Europe because you said in, in the UK, it's already shipped. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And people are receiving it in there. So I'm sure that uh, it'll be wherever you buy books, you'll be able to get it uh, at some point soon. Wonderful. Uh, and then wanna, previously, if you want to find out about yeah, I was going to say, if you want to find out a little more uh, in the meantime, you can just go to selfreliantentrepreneur.com or anything that I've been doing the last 30 years, you can find at uh, ducttapemarketing.com as well. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and the previous book we talked about was uh, the referral engine. So you can find that as well. That's right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. This has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it. And 
I also hope that you'll join me on this journey to a kinder marketing paradigm. Now more than ever do we need more love and empathy and gentleness in business. Please invite your friends to join us by sharing this podcast or the Gentle Business Manifesto with them. Both can be found at thegentlebusinessrevolution.com. Let's be the change we want to see in the world. See you next time. Thank you.